Now you've seen the you've seen the breakdown in the bulletin. We're going to have four different presentations, and the and the uh, the first one, as is as is my usual way of doing things, is to paint the backdrop and to frame the context that we're going to be dealing with. So we're not we're going we're not going to be dealing a lot with Witherspoon himself tonight. We're going to be talking about the world in which he lived, because that. Will, uh, will be very um, important to understanding his, uh, his moves going forward. Okay, the, um, to remind you a little bit, this, this, is, the, this is the stuff we have sc- covered so far, right? We started with Martin Luther in 1517, and we went to John Calvin, and then uh, John Knox, the National Church in Scotland, the Second Reformation. We went back to the Puritans last year, and uh, that covered uh, from 1558 to roughly 1700. And uh, then a couple of other events. William and Mary made a significant change in England. Uh, and just to put a uh, time frame on this, uh, Jonathan Edwards is... Um, uh, is in 1730s to 1743, and it's around 1740 that the Great Awakening happened in the United States. Uh, Matt, is this focused really well? Okay, okay, I won't. Uh, um, now I, I put this up because this is this just give you a time frame about where everything is, and where our our mindset has been tracking for the last several years. We've been looking at heroes of the faith. We've been looking at the various issues uh, that are going along, and, and we have seen the progress down through, uh, down through the middle of the 18th century and wound up in the United States last year. Uh, but there is a lot more going on in the world, and unfortunately, uh, not, of it, not all of it is, is something that would be affirming to us or encouraging, but you need to know what else is going on in the mind of man as, this, uh, as, as all of this has been going on, as we've been putting our attention in this arena, we want to now look tonight at the other arena of thought, of American thought. And to do that, we need to go all the way back to even before Martin Luther, get a running start, okay? And that is that we need to start with the Black Plague. The Black Plague came and swept over Europe from uh, 1347 through to um, 1350, and then there were a couple of recurrences after that. But the the Black Plague was just an utter disaster for all of Europe, and many, many, many people died. In fact, it was was overwhelming. This is just one uh, portrait or painting uh, of... um, uh, of one or two men who are uh, digging um, graves. You got this one, this one down here, and then you got one, a couple, uh, one up here, a couple up here. But the rest of it is just they're they're coming with caskets, all just, and and it was a very dreadful time. It really was quite uh, unbelievable in terms of the amount of death that occurred, and uh, when all of that happened. It, uh, it, it challenged everything that uh, mankind knew or took for granted or regarded in terms of reality. One of the things that, um, one of the things that happened was that death was imminent to us all for real. Uh, if, 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 uh, if a couple of your members of your family could catch it one day and actually be dead the very next day, Certainly, I was, my turn was coming, and there was, uh, there was a sense of death is right around the corner, and it's serious. And then, because that was the attitude, it began to change people's perspective on whether, it was, whether I should bother doing what the church tells me to do, or should I just enjoy myself? Should I just... You know, should I pray, or should I eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow I literally am going to die? Uh, And uh, that was uh, seen as the the dance of death, you know, that 
that no matter what you do, no matter how good you try to be, it's, it's inevitable you're going to, you know, the black death is going to take you, and that was very serious. The other aspect of this, of course, is that the church had no answer. The Roman Catholic Church had, uh, for uh, an entire millennium, had controlled the thinking of everyone. Controlled the mindset, controlled reality, controlled the worldview. You do what the church tells you to do, you march to the church's drum, and everything will be okay. You may, you know, you may get purgatory, you may do this, you know, all of the things. They built this entire theology just out of control of people. And with the Black Death coming, that no longer was a sign of hope. You couldn't, the church, you go to the church and, you know, what should I do? What should I do? And they had no answers. Of course, they said, pray. They would say, it's your fault. You've sinned. You need to repent. So I do a lot of repenting. Nothing changes. Um, the, the, the Black Death, if it did anything, it broke the grip of the Roman Catholic Church in those days. And people began casting the church off. If they're, you know, put that together with the dance of death idea, if there's nothing worth living for, there's nothing worth hoping in. And so more and more people started to turn away from the church in terms of uh, saying that it had any option of, of help at all. Uh, and, and this uh, had a sense of, in, in, in many people's minds, this had a sense of liberation. This was almost freeing. I'm, 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 I'm going to do what I want to do with the time I've got because I don't, I don't know how much time I've got. And it unleashed the, uh, the thinking of, uh, of man's minds and hearts and government. Um, and uh, it also changed in terms of one's pursuits of pleasures, interests. Uh, there would be some who would be studying medicine, and now they pursued that with much more vigor, things the church might not approve of. They didn't care. And because they pressed on and started to make some discoveries and started to make some achievements and started to lay the church and its grip uh, to the side more and more and more. And uh, so as the, as the Black Death began to fade away, the return to the church never happened. Uh, the old ways, the old traditions were being rejected. One's loyalties, uh, attention and energy began being put forth in what man wanted. What I want for myself is more important now than anything else. And I want to pursue this, and I want to pursue that, and I want to pursue the other. And so the, there was a, 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 a drop in, in the worldview of the Roman Catholic Church, and they, set it, and they, they were just eager to set that aside. Now, after that, after the Black, uh, the black Death began to fade, remember, we're still not at Martin Luther yet. Um, that is when the Renaissance began. You probably, some of you may very well have a you know, handle on the Renaissance, and you may understand it very well. Others of you can't even, can't even spell the word Renaissance, like me. You know, I have to look it up every time I use it. Like, Renaissance, how in the world do I spell that? But, and, and what it meant really didn't make a lot of sense to me either. But the Renaissance is, is kind of like, well, you, you, you probably have been to a, a reenactment kind of Renaissance fair, right? You ever been to a Renaissance fair? There's all kinds of booths about various things, crafts and, and articles and things. That's exactly what the Renaissance was. It was a pursual of a whole bunch of different kinds of trades and crafts and, and schools and interests. And uh, it allowed uh, a, a, a virtual explosion of investigation and development and discovery. And so when you talk about the Renaissance today, you think of everything from philosophy to art to music to architecture. Uh, there was an explosion of things that man was finding he could do. And it was all because the Black, De Pla Black, Black Plague had released his thinking from the, from the Roman Catholic. We didn't look to the Catholic Church anymore for approval or disapproval of those things. I just did what I wanted to do. And so the Enlightenment was started off subtly, but grew in its, uh, in its interest and 
and the worldview that was provided by the church as being, uh, was being blamed for the fall of Rome. You know, if you remember, uh, after, after Christ, uh, the fourth century was the uh, declaration that Christianity was legal. And then from that point on, there was a control of the church, central control of the church by the government, and that lasted for a thousand years. And the Black Death was that which broke that control over people. And now the church was seen as being the one to blame for holding man back. For a thousand years, the, the church has been in control of us, and it hasn't done us any good at all, and it, the church has held us back in so many ways. And, uh, and that was, uh, that, that's how that were, it was figured. Now, of course, they were forgetting the fact that, that um, the, uh, the cities were, being, uh, were, were destroyed and, and, and decayed, and people were fleeing to the countryside. They forgot the fact that it was the church that, that held on to literacy, and held on to the scriptures, and held on to what scientific endeavor they did approve of. And so it was the church that really held civilization together through the so-called Dark Ages. But by the dark time the Dark Ages was over, the church was blamed for holding man back and all that. So there was this uh, virtual explosion in all of these things. And one of, the, one of the things they wanted to do, the more aggressive ones, one of the things they wanted to do was, okay, we've thrown off the church after a thousand years, Let's go back and see where, and pick up where we left off. Let's go back to, to see where we were and how good things were and move from there. And so there was a return to the sources, as they said. It was the earliest form of humanism, which was not uh, what we think of as human, human, humanism today. But they went back to the, the art and the, and the science and the, and the philosophy of ancient Rome. So you return to Aristotle and Plato, and, I mean uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and you start from there philosophically. Uh, in terms of medicine or in terms of mathematics, you might, uh, you know, uh, you might have, uh, you go back to the original mathematicians in, in that time period, and of course one of those guys was named Pythagoras. You know, when you're, you're studying what is geometry, you have to memorize the Pythagorean theorem. You know, and again, it's a word you can't spell. But Pythagoras had a much more, inf a much more influential statement or, f or thought than just mere mathematics. He, back before all of this was occurring, he was the one who said man is the measure of all things. What I decide is true is true. And you see, it was, it, was, it was Christianity that came along and said, no, no, you, you have to listen to God. And now, because God has been, has been rejected in terms of the Catholic Church, and they're going back to the sources, they discover again Pythagoras' claim, man is the measure of all things, and they said, well, of course he is. Of course, we should have, known, we should have remembered that years and years and years ago. We need to pursue that and go from there. In architecture, they went right back to Romanesque uh, designs and, uh, and moved on in, from there. There's the, so there's Renaissance uh, construction that's going on. The, uh, the art uh, is, is developed in a, in a very aggressive way because now artists are challenged to, to depict their paintings and their, and their um, uh, sculptures from their own perspective. And it's very, ma everything has become man-centered again. And, that, and so the Enlightenment is the explosion of man-centered thinking, which all sounds very exciting, of course, except we forget that man is sinful, heart sinful above all things, can't be trusted. And so we know that there's going to be a deterioration of this. One of those, just to give you an example of that, one of the deteriorations comes in the form of Nicola uh, Machiavelli. Ever heard of Machiavelli? Some of you have, some of you haven't. Whenever you watch the news, you are seeing Machiavelli in action. Okay? He lived from 1469 to 1527, so it's during his time that Martin Luther is nailing his theses to the, floor, to the wall of the, to the church building door, and the Reformation is beginning to start. But that's, so that's how far back we had to go. Uh, just, to, just to introduce you to uh, Machiavelli, Machiavelli was an Italian diplomat 
He was an author, he was a philosopher, and he was an historian. He wrote his most significant work early. It was called The Prince. And there was a, a, he, he wrote something else as well, but The Prince is far more uh, influential and significant. He is referred to as the father of modern political philosophy, modern political science. Well, that doesn't sound bad. Uh, but listen to what he did. He denied the role of absolute morality in the administration of the state. So there is no God. A prince should be prepared to deceive and otherwise violate moral standards in order to preserve order and, of course, preserve his own power. In holding that in politics, the ends justify the means. Thank you, Mr. Machiavelli. That was his most significant contribution. And so every once in a while, you'll hear somebody on the news say, well, I think he's acting a little Machiavellian. What does he mean by that? He means he's acting selfishly for his own purposes and his own political position, and he is w willing to do anything for power. Does that sound familiar? Nothing's changed. The more things say the change, the more things stay the same. He regards religion as a tool at the disposal of the political ruler, and he says that is absolutely legitimate. Politics is always a game played with deception, treachery, and crime. So, you know, this goes, this is, this is how, this is what we, they're thinking in terms of the Renaissance in the, in the 16th century. How long has this been with us? This is the stunning thing. We all think that all oh, this poli politics has really gotten bad just in my lifetime. No, <laughs> we're talking 500 years, 600 years. So, uh, the next thing that comes along is the development of what, what's referred to as secular philosophy. Now, here's where you're liable to fall asleep. <laughs> secular philosophy picks up with, remember, go back to humanism, go back to the sources. You've got uh, Arist uh, so uh, Aristotle, Socrates, uh, Plato, uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. We'll pick up and we'll go from there. All of those thoughts, all of those men, started with me, man, and they developed their thought from there. God is, not, God is out of the picture. Revelation is certainly not something we're going to pay attention to. So they are reinventing the wheel in the name of man. They're, they're, is they're pushing that, that, that thousand years of church reign aside. They're saying, we're, we've lost enough ground. We're going to start all over. Okay. Now, when it comes to secular philosophy... I, when I started college, way back when, around the time Machiavelli was around, yeah. I was originally a philosophy and religion major. Big mistake. I never got my hand, mind wrapped around what they were teaching. So I am going to give it to you in a thumbnail sketch that I wish somebody had told me because it makes it easy to understand. Okay. Even you and I can grasp this. Now, is it all the, all the details and all the issues? If anybody's read philosophy and grasps it, you're going to think, oh, you're so elementary. Fine, I don't care what you think. <laughs> um, but this is the way I wish I had been introduced to it, okay? Secular philosophy divides up into two sections in this part. The first is rationalism. Oh, no, we're in trouble already. That's a big word. Rationalism. This is what rationalism is. Human reason, human reason is the ultimate authority. Ultimate authority of truth and of falsehood, of right and wrong. Reality has an intrinsically logical structure. That is a tip of the hat to the great creator. The world does make sense. Two and two do make four. Building blocks will stay in place. There is an order to the universe. We recognize that. Uh, we use it. So there is a so reason builds on logic, and of course that's, that's a very classical principle. Certain truths exist, and the intellect can directly grasp those truths. So there are things in the world that we can easily grasp and understand. It's not like we have to figure out everything. There are things that are basic and things that are understandable. And so rationalism says, it, when I look out in the world, I see what I've got. I, I know it's true. 
And, it, and rationalism is a methodology or a theory in which the criterion of the truth is not sensory, but intellectual and deductive. So I can figure this out on my own. That's what it means. Rationalism says I, I have a mind. I can figure this out on my own. Okay? Now, the, there were three um, big names uh, of, the, of this period of time that, um, uh, that were rationalists. They were philosophical rationalists. Uh, and I put them in this way because I want you to compare where they fall chronologically with what we've been studying before. Okay? There's Rene Descartes, there's Spinoza, and there's Leibniz. Those are the three biggies when it talks about rationalism. Let me just uh, show you one. Uh, Rene Descartes lived from 1596 to 1650. He was a French rationalist. He was a, a philosopher, a scientist, a mathematician. He was seminal in the, ground, uh, in the growth of modern philosophy and science, modern being his day and age. Uh, he, was, he regarded himself as a devout Catholic. Uh, they weren't saying, just boldly speaking, that the Catholic Church was worthless. At first they were trying to say, well, science and philosophy can line up with the Catholic faith and we can, we can coexist, and, and that's, that's how it started, and then slowly but surely they pushed the, the, church, the theology of the, of the gospel out. Uh, he regarded himself as a devout Catholic. Uh, one, one, uh, one person says he was intent on finding knowledge that was absolutely certain. He was a rationalist. He said, I want to find knowledge that is absolutely certain, that I can count on, that I can take to the bank. Knowledge that he clearly and distinctly perceived to be true, so he resolved to doubt everything that was not absolutely certain. So his key to reality, his key to figuring out everything, was not the truth of revelation, but doubt. How do I know this is true? And he applied doubt to everything. And you know what he came up with? He came up with this point. The only thing I can know for sure is that I doubt. <laughs> That's the only thing I can know for sure. Everything else I can doubt, but, I, but the, the only thing I know for sure is that I doubt. But uh, uh, he doubted everything of which he was not absolutely certain, everything that could possibly be doubtful, but none of his fields of study yielded a, cer a certainty that satisfied him. He just, was, he just was always restless about this. He wrote the Discourse on the Method in 1637. That's where he got his, his I think, therefore I am. Uh, anybody ever heard of that? You know, that was his famous profound statement. Huh? What? I think, therefore I am. You know, we have all kinds of perversions on that today. But, uh, but you know, it was, it was he, he, because he doubted everything, because he started with, because his key was doubt, he finally concluded by saying, the only thing I can be sure of is what I am sure of. Uh, that's the only thing he had for, uh, for it. He wrote other, other books as well, but, uh, but that's, that's basically what a ration, how a rationalist approaches reality. On the other side of the coin, secular philosophy offered empiricism. That's even a worse word for me, empiricism. So let me illustrate this for you so you get a handle on this. Rationalists say, I've got a mind. And in that mind, there is logic. I can think, I can process, I can deduct truth. I can doubt, but I can find out the reality of truth. An empiricist says, yeah, you've got a mind, but wait a minute, how does the mind get its information? The mind gets its information from the senses. So you have sight and smell and touch and taste and hear, and the empiricist would go on to say, you also have other uh, senses, you have feelings, you have emotions, you have things that you love, you have things that you hate, you have things that you like that bring you pleasure, and things that you don't like, things that bring you pain. So the empiricist said, it's not the mind that determines reality, it's the senses. All right, now here's where it connects with us today. The empiricist would say, I feel like you are offending me. Who does that sound like? Both. 
woke, right, the cancel culture we're in today. They are, we're in a revision, a, a return to empiricist philosophy. My feelings are the most important thing in the world. My feelings are the most real thing that exists. And if my feelings are this way, who are you to say my feelings are wrong? So empiricism has now become a, an enormous monster in the room. Um, the, the, the famous empiricists that uh, you might come across in terms of names are, include Thomas Hobbes, Locke. You hear about Locke a lot during the uh, revolution. Uh, Berkeley, who I've never heard of before, and of course, David Hume. Now, now, John Witherspoon, just so you understand, John Witherspoon was born in 1724. So he's right after William and Mary, and he's born before uh, the, the Great Awakening. So Witherspoon is in this area here, and, and David Hume comes along. He is a contemporary. He lives the same time that, that Witherspoon does. Uh, Hume lived from 1711 to 1776. He died the year of the Declaration of Independence. The reason I bring up him is because he was a Scot, as was uh, John, uh, John Witherspoon. He was a Scottish empiricist. And, uh, and hear the way that he talks about reality and, uh, and how his, his philosophical approach to truth is. He says, our knowledge starts with the distinction between our impressions, those are the things that our senses give us. Our senses give us impressions, he says. It comes into our minds by, with impressions. And he says, we make a distinction between our impressions and the ideas we form from those impressions. That's our mind working. The ideas are, okay, this plus this means this. When the impressions are what comes in, the ideas are what we, what we conclude about them. Impressions are the raw data which we receive through senses. Ideas are conclusions we draw about the impressions. He says there are no abstract ideas. We only gain knowledge by experiencing them. From human experience alone, no one can determine the existence of a human spirit, a soul. Because there's no evidence for it. I don't feel a soul. I don't sense a soul. I don't... There is an, so he, he dismissed the fact that there was a human soul. No one can determine the existence of a human spirit or that the self is, in, its, in some sense, eternal. Where do you get that? Of course, you, know, you set the Bible aside. And he concludes, God's existence, therefore, must also be denied. God doesn't come to me through my senses, and therefore I have no experience of God, <laughs> denial of the Holy Spirit, and therefore, God can't be real. He goes on in, uh, in a book he calls Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. He says, although we have seen many products of human design, such as houses, yeah, okay, I look at a house, and I see, see yes, that was built by somebody with intelligence, and I can see how it was constructed, and I can see the work that's being done on it. There is only a very slight analogy between those and the whole universe in terms of God creating it, it's only a slight analogy. Similarly, the analogy between the human mind and the divine mind is rather weak. And this is where he, he points to things that are mean, cruel, and sinful in the world, and he blames them on God. Uh, God's mind is thought to be eternal, immutable, omniscient, etc., but we don't have any experience of that here. He holds God's immu uh, you know, eternal attributes against us. God says he's eternal. Well, I don't know what eternal is, and therefore it can't be real. Um, even if it's proved that God designed and made the world, that does not prove in turn that God is infinite, perfect, and the like. The world is imperfect and finite. There's nothing like God in the world. You know, he's always, he's just drawing by what he sees and what he feels and what he hears, and he formulates, he says, my heart and my mind are the uh, is the, getting Protagoras again, is the measure of all things. And once I go there, I can take off in all of these directions and think that, uh, that I'm actually accomplishing something. Most significantly, there is evil in the world, he says, which raises the question whether it could have been designed and, by, by, and made by a perfectly good being. 
And there's evil in the world, and doesn't that just you know, cancel the fact that God says he's pure? Where would evil come from? Or it can't come from me, of course. So, you know, and let's see, I think there's one more. Hume argues that there can never be sufficient evidence to, aff- this is about a miracle. This is about, are there miracles? And he says, there can never be a sufficient evidence to affirm that a miracle has ever taken place. Sufficient evidence, in other words, what did, what did you see? What did you hear? Uh, did, is there enough evidence for, for, for a miracle to take place? He begins by defining miracle as a violation of the law of nature. We always have more evidence for the normal course of nature than we have for any claimed exception of it. So when confronted with a strange event, we should always prefer the natural explanations of it to the supernatural explanations. You ever watch Discovery Channel or, or of the other channels that always want to tell you what a simple, rational, empiricist description or explanation of, of, of uh, uh, Moses crossing the Red Sea would be? Uh, dis- or oh, the plagues? Do you realize they could have been done by natural causes? You know, the, these, these shows that, that try to explain away miracles by scientific study and by investigation, they're just David Hume. They're just, they're, they're just following in David Hume's pattern and, uh, and doing what, what he did. And so in the result of that, he says, no miracle has had witnesses of sufficient character, education, and intelligence to warrant our belief. Why should I believe in something? I don't believe it's ever been validated enough. Of course, anything you might say would fit that, right? If, uh, you know, say, well, here's proof. Says, well, he backs up one statement. He says, well, show me more. You know, okay, here's more. He backs up. He says, well, show me more. He's never satisfied. He's the measure of all things. He's got the right to say, I'm never satisfied. Therefore, it doesn't exist. You see, where, where Rene Descartes, the rationalist, used doubt as his key to interpret reality, the empiricist, like David Hume, used skepticism. I don't think that's possible. I don't think that could be the case. He used skepticism to say that, to to hold on to the idea that I am in charge, I am the measure of the whole world. Okay? Now, did you understand that? Yeah, you agree with me. If they had started with that, you all be philosophy and religion majors, right? Yeah, right. Okay. So we get back to uh, to this, and there's, you know, with, so there's, there's secular philosophy going on, there's Machiavelli going on, there's the uh, justification for stabbing people in the back politically, uh, and the world is becoming, uh, has, has so much wonderful Renaissance art and wonderful Renaissance progress on one side, but man's corruption is, is, uh, is showing itself in politics, and in the meantime, he's developing his thought and he's trying to grow in his thought about how far I can come to make myself the center of the universe and push God out of the picture. So where, is, where, is the, where are the religious people during this time besides the things we've studied here? These guys are the ones on the left. They're the ones who never have left the, well, Martin Luther, of course, returned us to the Bible as the foundation, revelation as the starting point for reality. The Bible is the starting point for reality, right? Martin Luther's the one that brought us back to that. Uh, Calvin, Knox, they all built on that. We don't leave revelation. Revelation is what God tells us. What God tells us is true. But there's so many other people who are rejecting revelation setting God aside and progressing on and thinking they're making advances in man's ability to, have, to, to think and to be and to exist in all of these strange and bizarre ways. There are other things going on as well. Um, I call it uh, theological moderation in Europe. I use the term moderation because that's going to show up later. Moderation is actually uh, a very important term during this period of time. Moderation is defined uh, or defines Christianity as the pursuit of ethical ideals and rhetorical excellence which could lead their provincial nation into enlightened greatness. Isn't that what I've always told you? (laughs) You know, this is, in other words, it's made Christianity moralism 
and moralism has always challenges mankind to grow and to progress and become better. And so it's an effort to say, well, yes, we still have the church, we still have the Bible, if you want to read it, but man has been gifted by God, if God is there, to progress. And we shouldn't be sneezing at that. We shouldn't be sniffing at man's progress. This is a great thing. This is a wonderful thing. So moderation begins to infect the church. It says, you know, there's on one side that you've got, we, we, stay, we want to stay in the church, we want to stay Christian, but we think that God is calling us to grow and become more sophisticated and become more enlightened in our thinking. And uh, so moderation begins to show itself in some very significant figures during the period of time we've studied. First there is Jacobus Arminius in, uh, in Holland, and he's, he's one of the first ones to, in the church, a theologian in the church, recognized by the church, to say that, to, you know, I'm a Christian, but, my, but, but, what I, but, you know, but what it means to be a Christian is simply to progress in being good. God wants me to be good. He wants me to, to share with other people. He wants me to, to bless uh, others. He wants me to, to grow in my goodness. And, uh, and, and it, it's slowly beginning to question the idea of um, total depravity, to put it coldly, the idea that we start off as sinful human beings. What does that have, what, how does that help anybody? Uh, we, we need, we all the, the Lord wants us to grow and wants us to be better and wants us to improve society and wants us to do all of that kind of thing. So Arminius uh, starts that moderate kind of tone. He's dealt with very harshly in the canons of Dort where his, uh, his, uh, his Arminian followers are thrown out and the five points of Calvinism are embraced. But particularly in Scotland, and that's of course where we're going to focus again, particularly in Scotland, Theological moderation is, is, is now infecting the church in a, in a great and serious way. Um, we don't need to take the Bible seriously. We don't need to take this idea of man being a, a fallen sinner before God seriously. We don't need to take the, the uh, supernatural miracles, the resurrection of Christ. We don't need to take those things seriously. We just need to become better people. And so there's all kinds of theological moderation beginning to infect the Scottish church during this time. And as well as political wrestlings over who it is that runs the church now. And uh, we'll discuss that uh, another time. And, but an example of theological moderation is Francis Hutcheson. And he is also a rough contemporary with, uh, with Witherspoon. So I wanted to il illustrate or show you him. Francis Hutcheson was an Irish Presbyterian minister. He was educated and then taught at the University of Glasgow. His major works included the inquiry into the original of our ideas of beauty and virtue. This is what we need to study, beauty and virtue, uh, defined, of course, by our own uh, sense. Essay on the nature and the conduct of the passions. Uh, that's simply emotions, not passions, but, but our feelings. They called those passions. And he wrote a two-volume uh, systematic theology or philosophy. And he said, beside the five physical senses, man also possesses the sense of beauty. These are inherent. These are things that God has given us. Sense of beauty, honor, and morality. The moral sense is capable of discerning actions and affections, approving those that are virtuous and disapproving those that are vicious. You know, so you can see it's very close, isn't it? We do believe in a moral universe. We do believe that God wants us to go in a moral direction. But there's no sense of God following Christ in this, rejoicing in our salvation. This is something he's just called all mankind to do. And so slowly but surely, we're setting aside the, the principles of the, of the true Christian faith, and we're just using the church, using the Christian church, the message, to, uh, to bring about advance as we think of advance should be. The gospel is set aside and it's replaced with man's effort toward societal improvement through cultural refinement. And as you might have expected, he interacted and was influential with, among others, David Hume. 
So, uh, so that's the kind that, that he characterizes that theological moderation. And like I said, moderation is going to show up um, next time. Um, now, other aspects that I want you to know about are if you've got moderate, the, moderate Christianity, you also have liberal Christianity. You've got liberal theology. You've got those who say they're Christians but have even become more pro progressive in their thinking and more aggressive in their leaving the Bible uh, out of the picture. And you have two sides to this. The one is deism. Deism, of course, is going to be very important. You probably come across it in your studies of the American Revolution. You probably heard the, the phrase, uh, you know, some of the founding fathers weren't Christian at all, they were deists. And so deism is, is a, a strong developing thought in this period of time. Here are some of the noted deists of the day. Uh, Locke, for one, there in the, in the middle, was very influential to the American uh, colonists, uh, Tyndall, uh, Toland, and Lessing. But let's take, for example, just as an example, uh, E.R. of Cherbury. He was early. He was an English soldier, he was a diplomat, he was an historian, and a poet, a religious philosopher. His one publication was uh, De Veritate uh, on Truth in 1624. And he's, uh, the statement that he said there was truth is a just conformation, a conforming of the faculties, your abilities, everything you have with one another and their objects. And so he is called the father of, de of English deism. And this, listen to what he says. He, he says, belief, if God based on reason rather than revelation or teaching of any specific reli uh, religion. Belief of God. Uh, God is there. God, God exists. But he is not distinctively of the Christian label. God is there. And in other words, here's the, here's the guy who came up with the idea that uh, you know, God is on top of a mountain and there's several paths to the top of the mountain, whether it's Christianity, one's Islam, one's this, that, and the other. Whichever one you want to go on, you just climb the mountain. What's, but what's, the, what's the Bible say about that? The Bible says uh, climbing the mountain is not the issue. Everybody's running away from the mountain. That's the issue. And there is, after all, only one way. So he says belief in God uh, is, is based on reason rather than revelation. We can set the Bible aside and we don't have to pay attention to it. Reason is what God has given us to figure out where, who we are and where we're going. And, uh, and, it, and that is not limited to any particular religion. The deity, he says, he wants to honor this God. He says the deity is worthy of our worship. So however you believe, whatever you believe, what church you go to, go to it and worship God. He says, that's your duty as a creature. Uh, he, uh, he says, virtue combined with piety, virtue, uh, com goodness, v combined with uh, a, a gentle spiritual uh, attitude is the chief element of such worship. What does that mean? Sincerity. As long as you feel you're doing good, as long as you are sincere, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Human beings, he says, should not sin, but if they do, they should repent. Um, sin is a choice. It's not a legacy. It's not something that's been handed down. It's certainly not a curse. We have, the, you know, the deists reject the fallen nature of man. And so now you've got, um, you know, the idea, well, if you make a mistake, you can, you can apologize for it, and you should. That's what a good deist would do. Uh, and the goodness of, and the justice of God will prevail in the end. Boy, I'm reminded of that. <laughs> uh, I don't want to uh, get into controversial issues here. Um, I could really, anyway. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's an example of English deism in, of the day. Uh, alongside of that, you had enlightened biblical theology. You had those in the church, not those who wanted to go outside the church, but when I say in the church, but they apply enlightenment thinking to theology. And among them, you had uh, Blaise Pascal, you had Butler, you had Reed, and you had Paley. And I'll just focus on Pascal, because some of you might have heard his name. He was a French mathematician and a physicist 
inventor, philosopher, writer. He was a Catholic theologian. He held on to the Catholic faith. Uh, strongly influenced development of modern economics. He was a pioneer in natural and applied sciences. He defended the scientific method. He was more of a rationalist than an empiricist, although it was mixed. But he defended the scientific method. This would even be re ejected later, especially when evolution comes along. We don't, the scientific method, we don't, we don't need that anymore. The idea is, is I want to, it should be repeatable under uh, framed circumstances. And that uh, you should be able to, to see it, detect it, and, and discover it as being the case. That was the scientific method. And he's the one that pushed that forward. Uh, he wrote a couple of books uh, and, and made the point that the defense of the Christian religion was from, could be done from a rationalist point of view. Christianity just makes sense. It's logical. Therefore, you should believe it. Now, this is the world that John Witherspoon was, was born into. That's the point. That's why I bore you with all of this stuff. There's a couple of things I wanted you to get from this. Number one is, is that all of these kinds of th thoughts that are, that are invading and corrupting our world today are older than you think. The second thing I want you to remember is that they all started with the rejection of God and His revelation. The third thing is, of course, that they all pat themselves on the back for how far they think they are coming. They see it in art. Some of the most magnificent paintings and sculptures are out of the Renaissance period. The most beautiful buildings come out of the Renaissance period. They see it when they see concrete things and they think they are duplicating that beauty and that wonderful th in their minds. They're thinking their godless ideas are just as wonderful as architecture and art are, and music. And, they, and, and, and they're thinking, of course, man operating on his own, measuring all things according to his own will, is an advance where we've, we've done away with Christianity and we're, we're moving forward finally. And that's the, that's the mindset. Now, let's go back to our side of the category. Let's go back to the left side of the, of the stage here. We left the Scottish Presbyterian Church um, dealing with, uh, the, um, with Charles II, and the Killing Times, and the Covenanters, remember? The ones who stood firm. After that was over, uh, we noticed that the, uh, the Puritan period kind of came to a very rather quick end in 1700. I, you remember on our videos that uh, uh, Beakey uh, said, uh, it kind of just came to its, it just kind of fizzled out. The Puritan movement just kind of, fizzled out in, the seven, in 1700. Why was that? And of course, one political answer was is that, that Charles II's persecution, which made Christians stand for their faith and grow and claim godliness in the midst of persecution and attack, came to an end with the glorious revolution in Great Britain and the, and the entrance of William and Mary and their act of toleration. They said, we don't care what you believe. Believe what you want. We don't care. And all of a sudden, that took the strength and the energy out of that whole movement. And in the vacuum, man's attempts to redefine himself and to rediscover himself and to advance upon his own thoughts came in with a vengeance. But in Scotland, for one, there was those who held true, but now instead of fighting Charles II, they had nothing left to do but fight themselves. And in the Scottish Presbyterian Church, that was the church that John Knox started, the Church of Scotland, and uh, thrived in that. You remember that uh, when the... Uh, um, when the uh, divines wrote uh, and composed and, and published the Westminster Confession of Faith, that it was based on solid 
uh, a solid uh, exegesis and solid summary of the Christian faith. You remember that the, the Church of Scotland was the first to embrace that confession. But as we got closer and closer to, uh, to Witherspoon's time, the invasion of these other thoughts, the, the, the deists, the liberals, the moderates, coming into Scotland began to gra gra bring grave concerns. And so in 1711, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland said, okay, we're going to have to draw the line. We're going to have to make sure people are actually Christians when they are in the pulpits of our churches. And so they, they said, from now on, you all, all ministers must hold to a full subscription of the Westminster Confession of Faith. You must say, I buy it all. No exceptions. But it didn't take long for that to be challenged by the influence of moderates and politics and uh, just plain stubbornness because people wanted to think independently. And as a result of that, it brought about the first break in the Church of Scotland in those days. Here is a, here is a graph. Don't bother trying to read this. Uh, all I want to do is point this out to you. Here is, here is um, there's the, 60, uh, the, the uh, writing of the Confession, the 1733, uh, right here, the first rather significant break in the Church of Scotland over it, and there were others, and uh, that is, is to, its, to the church's shame. What I always like to point out, by the way, is in Presbyterian family trees like this, uh, what, what you should not take note of is the fact that there are also many efforts to reunite. You don't see those efforts in any other church family tree. Uh, so even though there's lots of split peas, as we call them, there is, there is still the effort in Presbyterian history to reunite and to put those, put those issues behind us and to move forward. So, um, so that, that's the, so that was the, that was the first break. It's, it, the, the break caused a, a, another denomination in Scotland, the ARP, to develop. Then there was a second uh, succession, and then there was a compromising preamble by the, uh, by the end of the 18th century saying, okay, we'll accept some diverge, some exceptions to the full subscription clause. That was that. But there was a, a struggle, and the struggle was because they saw all of these other influences that we've seen tonight coming into the church, and they didn't want it. They didn't want it. Because they wanted to stay true to the Westminster Confession. They wanted to stay true to the Bible. They wanted to stay true to the doctrine that man is fallen and that he must be restored by the Holy Spirit and that the gospel is the only truth and for a person to be saved, he must be born from above. Holding on to the basics of the faith was the framing of that. And if, so now it's, it's like, you know, the Scottish church against the whole world of different philosophies and, 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 uh, and thoughts that are taking off and developing and exploding across the world. And Witherspoon's going to be born into the Church of Scotland and face this right off the bat. What will it make, make what, will, what will that make Witherspoon. What kind of man will he be? What kind of, what kind of thought pattern will he have? What, which, which category is he going to fall under? And what difference does that make going forward? But uh, just to conclude tonight, let me wrap up with 1 Corinthians 1, 20, 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God that through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. 
For Jews demand signs and Greeks demand wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than the men, and weakness of God is stronger than men. Remember, this is written by Paul before it all started, and it's still true today. The most amazing thing about, revelation, about God's revelation is how it, it even critiques and dismisses that which is going to come. Okay, anybody have any questions? You have to wake up to ask a question. Yeah, Joyce. Is there any knowledge what actually caused the plague? I mean, a virus or something like that? Um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, the, this virus was brought in by fleas from, uh, from outside of Europe and uh, probably arrived on rats that rode on boats. And because it, because it was before normal hygienic procedures, nobody knew what caused it, nobody knew how to treat it. It was, it was virile. You would literally die within 24 hours. So there was not much time to figure things out to make you feel better, to cure you, even get you to a doctor if that could be possible. And, uh, and it, it, just, it was just uh, a, a horrific um, scourge upon Europe. I haven't dug into that. My, they must have been used to it themselves. Well, the whole of Europe, yes, but it came from outside of Europe. I think it came from, from Africa. or no, it came from China. What? China. China came from China. <laughs> See, some things never change. <laughs> Joshua. Yeah, well, when, after the time of Christ, um, the persecution of Christians rose rapidly. First, it was the Jews that would persecute Christians, and then it was the Roman government that persecuted Christians, and that went on for 200 years. Finally, by the time of Constantine, who came along in the beginning of the 4th century, he actually, he was, a, he was a last Caesar, he was one of the last Caesars, and he actually, his own testimony is he was converted to the Christian faith. And because he was converted, he made a decree, uh, Edict of Milan, all of a sudden um, Christianity is legal. You can be a Christian if you want and, and you shouldn't be persecuted. And that, of course, it was only a small step from there that Christianity became a royal religion. Well, if, you know, Caesar's a Christian, I think I'd better be if I'm going to kiss up to him. And so all of a sudden, Christianity became the royal religion. And if it's a royal religion, if it's the religion of the king, then it's more than just legitimate. I have to dress up. I've got, we have to build buildings that are uh, impressive to the, to, the, to the Caesar, and as well as to God, of course. And we have to do all kinds of pomp and ceremony because we have to make it legitimate. And because it was tied to the government, because Caesar was considered the head of the, of the church, then, of course, we might look to Caesar for um, what is right and wrong. And the church is beginning to develop and grow, and that authority, the, the, the religion, the gospel, if, and, and authority, man's authority married, merged at that time, and they never let it go. It developed into the Holy Roman Empire, where kings and princes had to answer to the popes, and that, of course, became more and more corrupt uh, until the, and, and that went on and developed and grew for a thousand years until the 1500s. So it's probably a very slow process. Yeah, it was. It was very slow. It was a. It was a. You know, it, it was abrupt in the fourth century, and then after that, it was just kind of a growth of that oppression and that control on the part of on the part of the church. Yeah. 
Oh yeah. During that middle age time. Yep. Probably mainly in the monastery. It, exactly. There were, you know, it, it, of course that wasn't an eat and clean thing either, but you had the, it was considered the, you, you know, you had your basic riffraff like us, you know, working people. <laughs> and we did what we had to do to support our families. And so the thing, only thing we could do would, would be to go to mass and, and pray. But if you really wanted to be a serious Christian, you would either um, go become a, a priest or a nun, or you'd go into the monasteries and, and, and give your life to, to prayer and that kind of thing. That was considered, you know, a, a notch above. Then, you, of course, you had the, the hermits. Uh, they would crawl off into, the, into, into a cave someplace. They were the most holy regarded because they gave up everything. Uh, you know, and so it was a distortion of what it meant to live for Christ. And it was considered, uh, you know, it, they, the more you sacrificed in this world, the higher you were, the more impressive a Christian you would be. But that didn't mean that necessarily everything that came out of your mouth was exactly biblical. It's just that everybody looked up to you, and, and if you said, oh, you know, the grass is pink, and they would, oh, wow, that's, you know, and they would accept it. Um, so it was a slow progress, and... And, you know, we only thank the Lord for the fact that, 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 that sincere Christianity was there in the weeds all the way along. But it certainly wasn't in power and authority, and it wasn't at the head of the church. And that's why Martin Luther got into so much trouble when he started the Reformation. He was just uh, challenging the whole idea that, that you know, the... the, the they wanted, the, the Pope wanted to build a new church at, at, at Rome. And well, like I said, this is the center of Christianity, so we should have the most impressive cathedral in the world. Where are you going to get the money for that? Well, he didn't have the money. So he went around to the poor people in Germany and, and uh, Switzerland and England and, and other places, and he said, uh, give me money and I will forgive your sins. Well, that's not... Bo, that's not going to work, you know, but, but it, it, people who, who are ignorant don't know that, and so they're scared into doing it. So they put money in the pocket, and, and they're told that they're, they're go, their sins are going to be forgiven. That's how they got the money to build St. Peter's. And that's the, uh, that was the last straw for Martin Luther. He said, enough's enough. I'm going to protest this. And he put his protest up on the door of Wittenberg, uh, Wittenberg Church, and that is what started the firestorm of the, Revo of the, uh, of the Reformation. It almost took, uh, almost, you know, like others before him, he was almost killed, he was almost executed for his opinion, but he wasn't, and, the, it's, it, and so the Reformation took off. <laughs> okay, next week we meet the man. Sorry that, uh, I, you know, that the context had to take so much time. But you see everything that he is going to be opposing if he's going to be any, if he's going to have the stature of a, of, a true, of a true believer. Let's pray. Lord, thank you very much for the patience of these folks. And, and, uh, and may it be an encouragement unto us that even though our world has long forsaken the gospel, that uh, we see in his folly that there has been no real advance. And we thank you, Father, that we have truth because you have revealed it to us. And then we align ourselves to you, we see, uh, we see hope and we see the gospel coming at true. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.